Hello. <laughs> Hello. All right, here we are. No, it actually, right. oh, it's like, apparently, like, it's been going for a minute and 45 seconds. Uh, apparently so. So, po oh, apologize. Oh, whoa. We yeah, well, there you go. Right. Okay, I don't need to be watching us at the no. same time. No. So, sure so uh, sorry about that, guys, um, about the very first part of this. Anyway, thank you so much for being here. Welcome to the show. Welcome to Racing Insiders Podcast. <laughs> I am Kate Dillon from Crate Insider. And I'm here today with Steve Hendren from Hendren Racing Engines. And a gnat on my beard. And a gnat. Does a gnat have a name? Uh, <laughs> no. Gary, Gary the gnat. <laughs> Gary. It's like Gary. Alex is Gary the guard spider next to his front door. We're at his house now. <laughs> oh, okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, it, we'll just blame everything on Gary. Gary. Yep. Yep. So uh, anyway, here we are. We've got a few folks here right now. I see Scott is here from, he says, hi, from way out west, where the Pettit Shootout is next weekend. Yeah, actually it is, yeah. And then my dad's race is going to be the following weekend in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So we've got uh, memorial races for people we know. Excellent. Up. That's great. And I see Darren is here from, says hi from Colorado. Yeah. And oh, and Scott says it looks better now. Yeah, <laughs> better than the black screen. I had yeah. to like shut down Chrome. It was black on us, yeah. Yeah, I had to shut down Chrome and restart it. And hey, I'm glad. Oh, and Brian's here from New York. So Brian's been yeah. uh, been on here. I, I always love his his uh, uh, profile picture here where it says uh, Facebook jail inmate. <laughs> Maybe I need to make one of those for you for Might your mug. To. Might yeah, because we're sporting our Racing Insiders podcast mugs today. And yeah, might have to make one, you know, just free from, well, you, you've covered it all up with your hand, but it's all good. <laughs> good stuff. So Steve, how's your week been? Yeah. I mean, well, I mean, since the last time we were on. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it was all right. Well, we were on last week. We just yeah, that's on what I'm saying. Week before. Yeah. yeah. You say week and it's like the beginning of the week. So it always throws me for a loop there for a second. Oh, okay. Like, yeah. So, so Monday wasn't bad. <laughs> There we go. But you had, yeah. So from the last time, you know, that's, yeah. that would be really my question. Um, speaking of questions, feel free to drop in any of your questions into the chat and we will do our best to answer them here on the show. Yeah. I had my buddy Steve Blackburn on the diner today with his new 525 that we uh, helped him get ready and all that stuff. So got our time and program in and all that. And it was the second best 525 we've had on the diner, actually. Oh, that's exciting. So, it's pretty cool. Good. Good deal. Well, and I'd like to know more about the 525 and what what items you recommend. Have you come out with a recommendation sheet for the 525? Um, not necessarily, no, because it's pretty much kind of a straightforward deal. It's essentially a plug-and-play engine. Um, I mean, what we found most important, obviously, is going to be, you know, what you're using for carburetor and fuel and headers and spacer and, I mean, the, the normal stuff. Mm -hmm. that you would deal with with like a 604 or 602 for instance but essentially it's just how hey, you plug it in plug in the box as long as you got the right tune in the box you're good to go so. 
Uh, yeah, but I think there's a lot of different options out there for the like the front Accessories drive kits and, stuff. and things yeah, like I, that. I, I use either KRC or Jones. Yeah, but, but it'd be nice to be able to provide a shopping list for people. True. Yeah. Like I should probably honest, honestly come out with a recommendation sheet. Yeah, it would be good. I mean, I know you really like the breather kits from from both of them. Yeah. From KRC and Jones. Yeah. Um, and for and the then, front drives. Then my, then my brother's now making a uh, <clears throat> deal on the 525s to where um, the oil filter bolts directly to the side of the block. Mm. So. <clears throat> now, is that something that's going to be commercially available? Uh, yeah, I believe so. Um, might be something that we'll get into making. Okay. Yeah. I'll just talk to Mike about that. Yeah, I would. Yeah. Because right, that's that's a challenge. It's just a slick setup for for the five twenty five, like especially in like a dirt late model. I don't know how it would work in like a sprint car or something, but yeah, we just haven't. It's not our forte as sprint cars, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but we can you know market it as a a late model oh, oil filter adapter. I know it fits in a Longhorn and an XR one, so that's what I know. <laughs> well, then you just covered about ninety percent of the market of chassis. Exactly. <laughs> right. <laughs> So yeah, yeah, you, you covered a yeah, bolt, you covered a bunch there. Yeah, oil filter bolts directly to the side of the block, and then the lines are only gosh, uh, inlet and outlets only about twelve inches long, roughly. Okay. So, well, that's good. And with that, you're using the standard oil filter, and then yes, you, are you using an oil cooler on those two? No, we're not, not anymore. Okay. I mean, that just takes out one more thing that did, I, I like what you you say about adding accessories, where anything you add gives you one more opportunity to have a failure. Well, I mean, on the 525 stuff, um, we just found that it, the cooler's not needed. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it just lowers the oil pressure even more. These things already have very low oil pressure, uh, you know, once the oil's up to temperature, so. Good to know. Oh, and Paul says, uh, I'm sure there is non-alcoholic booze in that mug. <laughs> Actually, what, um, so we'll, what are you we'll, drinking? We'll, we'll, we'll be drinking with him in two weeks. So. Well, I'll be DDing. Well, you'll be DDing. I'll be drinking. And yeah. My best friend from California is flying out. Yeah. And he's going to meet me and meet us in Pittsburgh. We're going to pick him up at the airport Thursday. So we'll be in, you know, kind of party mode. Yeah. Are, are you getting geared up with your keystones or anything? I have not practiced on these keystones. No, I, you know I don't as much as. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't. I, yeah, I, I don't think you need necessarily practice. But what's in your bug tonight, Steve? I uh, just ultra. Ultra. I am drinking. It's my go-to. I got to keep my figure. Yeah. <laughs> at roundish rather than completely round. Round is a shape. <laughs> <laughs> it's a shape. <laughs> you got to keep in shape. Round <laughs> is a shape. Um, I'm drinking sparkling water. I love my Soda Stream. Little plug for Soda Stream, not sponsored. I'm just saying, <laughs> but yeah, that's what I'm drinking. All right. Yeah, uh, that's, that's boring. boring. Um, yeah, okay, whatever. And Chuck is here. Damn, what a Monday! Y'all take a huge drink for me. <laughs> <laughs> and Mike is here. Hello, Kate and Steve. I, my yeah. Kate is in all caps. There you so go. They'll let you know that. I see you're more popular. And Paul says, you know, he will be. You will be. You'll be in shape by the, uh, with Keystones after that. So, I mean, the, the cool part about, like, this year for Dad's Race, so Paul's up there in, in Pittsburgh, and uh, he goes every year, obviously. And uh, I was able to secure enough money to make this a uh, 10000 win race on Saturday. Mm -hmm. And then Friday night, the night before, will be a 4000 win race. Oh, it's so, four now. It was three before. Yeah, it was four now. So. Wow. Congratulations and very exciting for all. Yeah, the and then and then, there. and then honestly, at Tyler County the night before that. So on Thursday night, I think Rush has a rain out makeup, and that's four thousand wins. So oh my gosh! It's you can hit three races in three days and eighteen grand up for grab, up for grabs. That's a whole lot of money. Yep. Yeah. Excellent. Um. So Chuck Siri says, "Y'all know I told y'all before my six hundred four hasn't been updated to beehives." You said it would be better to sell and get a newer one. Mm -hmm. Would it be feasible to convert it to a 602 since 602s are the prominent are prominently the classes close to my house? What's it, your opinion? It's, it's not, no, because you'd have to change uh, crankshaft. You'd have to change pistons. You'd have to change camshaft. You'd have to <laughs> rockers, heads. No, it's not feasible to convert it. It's really the... Well, what is the, I guess the block, the Chevy 350 the block, block, the block is the one and thing. The, the block and the connecting rods are the only two things that those engines have in common. Okay. So if you had to buy all that new, other than the block and the connecting rods, no, you're, you're exceeding the price of a new 602. 
Good to know. So you'd be better off, honestly, selling that to someone. Honestly, there's a lot of street rod dudes that love those 604s because, you know, they got with the cam in them and stuff. I mean, they're thumpy on the street. Mm-hmm. And essentially, they just need to, like, change the oil pan, and oil pan, oil pump and pickup. And they can run that thing on the street. And those street rod guys love that stuff. Great. Great tip. Okay, and uh, Mike is asking, has Steve installed his matched rockers, polished his, his ball, and <laughs> filled the tank with ab gas yet? <laughs> I attempted to polish my balls last night, but I fell asleep too early, so that didn't oh, work out very okay. good. Wow, that, you went full old man there. <laughs> um, but no, 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 I have not uh, no, I have not installed the matched rockers yet or anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's great. Yeah, that's a that's a good one. Uh, clearly, you've been watching. In fact, there was a comment on you know when when we did. Uh, so anybody who hasn't heard this before, uh, one of the questions we've received before is whether av gas or aviation gas would be the best fuel to run in a in a race car. Yeah. And Steve's has a very solid opinion on that, which which is extremely solid. Yeah, no, it's a total waste of time. I mean, I mean, if it's what you can afford and it's what's nearby, will the engine run on it? Yes, but there's no, you're not producing power with that gas. Yeah, well, we pulled that part out of the podcast, uh, that part of the video and put it out on YouTube. And it is one of our most commented videos. And oh my (laughs) God. So the comment section on that, and somebody commented this week and they were like, Oh man, the comment section here is like gold or something like that. It's it's good. It's like, just like how much you're an idiot. And yeah, I don't know. Uh, I I don't look at that shit. So (laughs) I don't give a fuck what anybody says. I do sometimes. And you know, it's, it depends. I mean, if, if you people want to be critical, as in bringing up a a fair point that we can have a debate about. Show me the dino numbers. Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> they say that on TikTok, too. But if I don't have a dino sheet for it, I mean, I, there's like I don't have dino sheets on the anti-reversion mufflers. Right. And, well, I can show you one today because. Well, today, good. So, Please do so yeah, that I, I can I, then show it on get, TikTok I so I don't you, look like a liar. I can give you a perfect example from today. So, uh the headers that were on Blackburn's 525 today, uh, some, so, somewhere in the, the profabs, but somewhere in the whole process, shit got screwed up in shipping, packaging, whatever. Mm-hmm. So they showed up with no mufflers, no anti-reversion mufflers. And uh, so I contacted Andy this morning and he actually sent somebody from Concord down here to me. So an hour and a half drive roughly and brought the mufflers and the stuff we needed to make everything work because we were on the dyno. So we'd already dynoed it beforehand without the mufflers. Okay. And once we put the mufflers on, everything Andy sent, uh, it changed. uh, We gained 34 foot pounds of torque at 3000 RPM. Oh, wow. Top end power remained the same. Matter of fact, got a little bit better. Torque was slightly better throughout the range above, you know, 5,000, but at 3,000 RPM, 34 foot, 34 foot pounds of torque. That's a lot. So I can prove it all day long. Those things work. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I knew you could. I just didn't happen to have a right. piece of paper in my yeah. hand. And so then they piled on. And then oh, I've been so. off TikTok for like months now. And honestly, the 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 more the more overlap you have in a camshaft, so the bigger the, you know, the, the more radical the cam is in your motor. For instance, just layman's terms, uh, the more this makes a difference. Oh, so excellent. Uh, Willie at Willie's carburetor and dyno shop, uh, he's seen a hundred foot pound gain. That's insane. Well, and that's going to be like on, a, super, on open open yeah. engines, yeah. Mm-hmm. Great. Okay, and so Chuck has a follow up. He says, "Yeah, I got you. I was under the understanding that the short blocks were the same." And thanks for clarifying. Yeah, that. unfortunately, they're not. Mm-hmm. Um, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, but um, no, they're they're not the same. Yeah. Uh, next question is from Jared. Now, now oh, what, I, what I will say between the six hundred three, which GM no longer produces, and the six hundred four, yes, the short block is one hundred percent the same. Okay. So those two are the same in the short block. Uh, the six hundred two is completely different. Well, the heads are the biggest thing. Well, well, oh, I guess everything. There's a lot that's the biggest, thing. A, yeah, thing. That's the biggest thing. The cam and being a difference, and yeah. yeah. 
Uh, Jarrett's got a question. He says, Steve, I've heard you talk about the strange oval twist axles mm -hmm. on your personal car before. Yep. What's your opinion on them? And do they make a noticeable difference? Are they worth the money? Uh, yeah, I believe so. Um, I mean, and what I'm going off of, I, I had, when I stopped racing, I had a set of those and I had solids that were not, you know, the twisty stuff. And I personally can notice a difference on like a, like on a slick track. So now, now, it, I mean, that kind of, that whole trend kind of went away for a little bit mm -hmm. where people just buy the twisty stuff and just run the twisty stuff all the time. So like on my son's car, we're changing axles to the racetrack, depending on track condition. Mm -hmm. So it's just another tuning device for you. And do I think they're worth the money? Yes. Now, let's, if for anybody who's not familiar with them, from what I understand is that they will kind of it's kind of a wrap-up effect so yeah so it'll twist back and and then when you need it then it's snapping forward so it's really pushing you essentially and in yeah i mean but no yeah there there is a difference and like alex he'll change them so he runs both 604 and 525 and they'll change them usually when they're in the 525 honestly they're running the solid axle or not solid but they're running the non-twisty axle Mm -hmm. um but yeah I, th I think it's worth the investment because it's just another thing i mean if you're looking for just every little bit mm -hmm. i think it's something that would benefit you well how does it feel as a driver because i understand that the feel is a lot different too because you're not used to that well there's there, there's a there's a different feel but it's not you don't feel any snap there's no oh, okay that's yeah there's no snap that you feel okay. it's just a smoother transition for when you accelerate oh interesting Great. Oh, Dream Shop is here today. And here they say, Steve has, Steve said running an alternator was better than a 16 volt battery. Why? We run a 602 and are required to run the HEI distributor. Mm -hmm. Our alternator kit did not show up last year. So we went with a 16 volt uh, bat, but, and I guess there's more to it here. Oh, 16 volt battery. Okay. okay. Anyway. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, no, I mean, not necessarily. I mean, it, I mean, 16 volt battery is fine. My point is like on a HEI, which is, you know, designed, in, you know, the mid sixties. Um, that's not something that is going to live. In other words, the coil is not going to live for a long time on the 16 volt battery. Um, kind of like 525s. So CT 525s today, they run coil packs, individual coil packs. Those are not designed to have more than 12 volts. Oh, so you have, you're eventually going to burn the coils out on them unless you're like buying MSC coils that can handle 16 volts all the time. Right. So um, normally if a guy's got to run an HEI, that's why I would normally run an alternator with a 12 volt battery. Okay. Good thoughts. And Stuart's here from Australia. Yeah. From our Good friends night. down under here. He says, hey, Steve, I feel like coming racing a modified down in the deepest south. I got you covered for a plane ride. 50% and unlimited VB. I'm there. <laughs> yeah, I feel like life is getting back to normal with our yeah, travel schedule. Just so long as I don't have to have the jab going over there. Ooh, yeah. that might be a little bit tough. Yeah, but uh, Well, step one is you need to renew your passport. Well, that, yeah, I totally fucked that deal. <laughs> you totally did. <laughs> you absolutely, um, I'm going to use your term. You, act, you absolutely screwed the pooch. Oh, no, I was going to say stepped on your dick. Or stepped on my dick, yeah. You, there's any number of things there. Actually, actually, I meant to look at that like a month ago or so because I've got, I've got a friend of mine that uh, trains uh, American Airlines pilots, and he was actually going to be able to get me in the simulator mm -hmm. to, like, fly, you know, like an Airbus or something like that in the simulator uh, without motion because it's not legal for them to do it with motion, but it would be like a – be like a giant video game mm -hmm. and uh he uh he said check your passport well i kept forgetting kept forgetting and then this thing came up yeah i've got two international trips scheduled back to back and my my passport i updated yeah. it in 2021 and so i'm like hey hey i can go on this trip it's like two and a half like three weeks from now yep. do you have your passport and we check and it my, expired. my shit expired in january yeah so i gotta get a passport renewal which i can expedite it but it's still like gonna be four to six weeks even six on the ex weeks, expediting right now, yeah. that's if they don't shut the government down so i would ask i would act on that <laughs> sooner rather than later exactly. 
No, the first time I got a passport, I, it was it was my all my application was already in and I was just waiting. And it was during the Obama administration. And that was one of the times that they shut down the government. I was like, great, great. I got a cruise scheduled. So <laughs> to have this passport and, and and now we have no government. We don't know. Yep. <laughs> I got like four passports because the one I had to renew because it was slam full mm -hmm. and there was not another page on it. And it wasn't even expired. <laughs> wow. You're just that popular. Well, I got a couple of questions that came in through an email that I want to talk to you about here. And this person, uh, Travis, says, I'm having an engine blueprinted at Hendron Engines and looking to purchase a front drive pulley system mm -hmm. for a 602 engine and a fuel pump. What do y'all recommend? This is for a street stock dirt car. So, so what is your recommended setup my, for a street? My go-to always is uh, KRC or Jones, either, okay. either one. I mean, I really honestly don't have a preference between the two because they're both top quality. I mean, if you want the best of the best, to me, that's the best of the best. Right. Um, I do not have an overall preference on either one. Well, but, but with um, that, would you, in a street stock, mm -hmm. would you say, hey, run uh, power steering on the back and just run crank to water pump on the front? Gen generally, or would you do a serpentine system? Generally in street stocks, they have to run the power steering on the front. Okay. Again, either system works just fine. Yeah, well, and I have all of them. Um, so yeah. for um, 602s and 604s. I mean... <sighs> I just want to give the best recommendation. Price, price shop it at that point. So if you can save 20 bucks, save 20 bucks. Okay. And either, either one's going to run just fine. Well, with that particular case, then I'll probably go with the, uh, there's that Jones system where it's mm -hmm. serpentine and it's, it's, it's all inclusive. It's got the yeah, it's, power yeah. steering pump yeah. and it's got a water pump with yeah, it and all the pulleys yeah. and everything. Yeah. Um, Pippi has decided to join week? the podcast. Yes, yeah, <laughs> he is. This is Pippi. What are you doing? Yeah. You interrupt <laughs> That's Pippi. Um, all right. Here we have another one. Oh, Glenwood Motorsports, actually, right down the road here. Mm -hmm. And says, do you recommend exhaust gasset, gaskets or the red high temp gasket maker on a 602 <laughs> headers? Uh, it depends on the quality of header you're using. Because, I mean, if you're using like shitty headers that got really thin flanges, then you might need both. Um, if you're running, you know, like if you're able to run like a quality header that has a really thick flange, stainless steel, something like that, then just the gasket works. That's what we use on our stuff. Uh, what are you using for 602 header gaskets these days? Uh, actually Mike's been working with Kemetic. Okay. And he's there, my brother, and he's got some stuff that he's shipping back to Kemetic to get them to alter to where we can get, uh, steel gaskets. The oh. multi-layered gaskets. Okay. I mean, because that's been a challenge. I mean, I was getting the success, yeah. all of my gaskets from uh, Dynatech. And I think they've kind and of... And then like on Blackbird's different. 525 day, we had the MLS gaskets from uh, Chromatic on that. Okay. We'll have to take a look at that. That'd be a good yeah. another good thing to... It is. Yeah. Um, and I'm not, asking and they're my not, tech questions too, guys. <laughs> they're surprisingly not expensive, so... Oh, okay. Well, that makes me happy. I like that. Uh, well, and, and he's sort of... Uh, Steve sort of chuckled when he asked about the red because it's an ongoing joke about how much you hate that red silicone. What's it called? RTV. <laughs> you have a hate, hate relationship with RTV yeah. when you're taking part in engines and it's, it's everywhere. It, it's bad enough on the headers when people glob it on there, but it's like when it's on the, like on the fuel pump boss and it's on the freaking radiator neck and it's like just <laughs> globbed on everywhere on the whole engine. That shit just pisses me off. All right. Now I've got another tech question for you here. This is from Jimmy. And this is, uh, he says, what would cause an E85 stealth carb throttle linkage to completely freeze up still halfway through a 30 lamp race on a 604? Uh, probably, probably the damn, uh, the uh, linkage itself is wore out. I mean, I mean, I get guys all the time that don't maintain their carburetors. So if they're not lubing the, the throttle shafts every week oh. and doing stuff like that, and they're just pressure washing the hell out of everything and the throttle shafts have like no lube in them. Yeah. They're going to seize up. Interesting. So. Okay. Good. Good thought on that. And any other questions you guys go ahead and, and drop them in. Uh, Steve's popular right now. No, so. it's just Alex. Okay. <laughs> See, you don't know where probably, our podcast Probably send me a doggy picture. Oh, <laughs> my, I got a grand puppy. A grand puppy. That's 
hilarious. Did he send you a puppy picture? No, it's not. It's just oh, like okay. a funny thing. Oh, okay. Great. <laughs> okay. Um, anyway, so have there been any questions that you've uh, heard this week that would be good to share? No, not really. Um, I mean, nothing I can recall, at least. So, yeah, I don't. I mean, you ask me that every week, and I just, I just don't write them down or think about it after. <laughs> Usually, I'm busy when I get those kind of questions. Well, and, and now to kind of change the subject, uh, I have been off of TikTok for a while because <clears throat> it's just such a toxic environment. But that's where the people are. So now I'm actually leading with shorts. Uh, so YouTube, and I guess this can be a little like digital marketing section of our podcast today. Yeah. But <clears throat> each of these platforms have different uh, parameters for what works for their platform, what mm -hmm. they want. Uh, with YouTube... And I spend more time on YouTube. I love YouTube. So I spend a lot of time there. Anyway, YouTube shorts are one minute or less. Right. Most of the others with the reels are like three minutes or yeah, less. Correct. Yeah, correct. But what I've decided to do is that I'm making shorts and then I'm putting them everywhere else too. So um, put out my first short today uh, that that I recorded. Yeah. Uh, put that on to YouTube and Facebook. Well, you know, as a reel. Right. And an Instagram reel and also on TikTok. Oh, cool. So. I'm just not going to respond if people say mean things. Um, there was a good TikTok question, though. Um, I'll have to really? find it. Yeah, and it's not all toxic. There's actually a really it, it can be good. It can be good. Um, wow. But there was a there was a question. Oh, How many I'm I'm sorry, you guys. I the thing about TikTok it just plays automatically, and it drives me crazy. I really don't like that about it. Um, but anyway, what was on our video about how many laps until you need to freshen a 602. Right. So this person had a follow-up question. What is the average number from the factory we should be looking for if we didn't check the engine when we got it? So we're talking about leak down testing. What are you looking for well, for, I mean, for I, a leak down? Well, it's going to be high because the rings aren't seated yet. Oh. And so on and so forth so i mean so no, you can't do a leak higher... down when it's brand new then. no when it's brand new i mean no because you can't get a baseline so once the rings are seated valves are sealing and all that stuff because i mean gm's also notorious for making it to where you know the valves don't seal up 100 percent right away <laughs> once the valves beat into the seats then uh at that point then you can run a leak down on it but okay it's not something you can do right out of the box because it's going to show a higher percentage of leak down Good, good tip there, yeah. and I and I believe we've talked about. I mean, the, most of these things when they're sealed up good, you're going to see two or three percent. Okay, and so. it's really anything under about ten or anything over ten is about its time. Or, uh, or no, no, not really, because a lot of times you've already raced the engine, and there's different variables. You know, it could have sat for a week before you did it, and there could be a little bit of rust on the valve seat. There could be, you know, what I mean, or fuel deposits that turn into, you know like that chalky shit that you see in the exhaust port, stuff like that. So, I mean, I usually tell everybody 15%. 15. Okay. Yeah. No, I just didn't know the number. I was thinking right. it was 10, but it's Or 15. I say 12 to 15. 12 to 15. Probably. And then it's time to take. And then if you get one that reads that, obviously at that point, start the engine back up, run it and try it hot and see what it seals. Up. If it's still 12, 15%, then yeah, it's going to be time to start thinking about going through one. Great. Oh, and William Glass is here. Nice to see you, William. Yep. Thank you for being here. And Mike is on fire tonight because he's like, can't wait to see your shorts, Kate. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I put my own emphasis on that. Right. <laughs> I forget sometimes when I'm just speaking like nerd speak that, oh, yeah, that could probably be taken a different way. Hey, it is shorts weather, though. It's warm. It's hot again. So I'm wearing shorts. My camo shorts. Well, it's like hot, no humidity. Yeah, it's not bad at all. So, no, I don't mind that. No, I so no, humidity I was, kicks my ass. I even went outside today and everything, but I hear it's gonna be like ninety by Thursday. So yeah, yeah, but, th but then it also drops off a cliff after that. <laughs> yeah, and then we go to Pennsylvania. So if it drops off a cliff here, man, I'm gonna need to bring my uh, my Under yeah. Armour. As long as there's no damn R word in the forecast, we're good. Yeah, we don't like that. No R words. No R words. It's just our, our word is different than what anybody outside of racing would call the R word. <laughs> For sure. 
Uh, you know what? We haven't uh, done our pod deck for a while. Oh, I go know. ahead. Oh, uh, I was just tell a story. I, I had an inter- interesting conversation with a friend of mine, and you, and you know him. Uh, he drives the tour bus for Artemis Powell. So, oh, the uh, of um, the yeah of Leonard Skinner. Z- Z- oh, I thought it was Easy no, Top. No. Okay. Well, he used to drive Easy Top's tour yeah. bus, but he's driving it for Artemis Powell, and he uh, he actually told me he's going to get me a T-shirt. That's autographed <gasps> from Artemis. So I was kind of looking forward to that. Though. Wow. That's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. I like it. And, you know, Artemis just lives in Morganton. No, didn't yeah, know that. Yeah, he lives in Morganton. So that was pretty cool. Wow. Ooh, I got a good question for you, Steve, from our pod deck, sir. Right. If you could have anything named after you, what would you want it to be? What would I want it to be? Yeah. Named after me? Yeah. Oh shit. Um, I already got a son named after me. Um, wow. So, God, I don't know. Other than that, a memorial race. <laughs> I'll go with that. <laughs> wow. Okay. Okay. I mean, fuck. I have no idea. Yeah. All Never right. thought I'd have anything named after me. <laughs> I don't know if you have enough money and you want to give it away, then you can, uh, then you can always do that. So, yeah. Yeah. But I don't know if you want to pick a question. So I got to give you one? I did. I I'm didn't, just going to randomly didn't. do this. Oh, okay. Yeah. When you were a kid, did you have any posters on your wall? If so, what? <laughs> okay. Well, I'm a kid of the eighties. So there was this giant poster of John Bon Jovi and then back then absolute had the best ads in magazines which were available for teenagers i mean crazy like between cosmopolitan anyway drinks were so pretty so i had all of these like magazine alcohol ads that were all over my room ironically you drink vodka when you drink isn't that it i guess it just i was like sleep it kind of it kind of got i was i sleep learned it yeah (laughs) <laughs> kind of absorbed that knowledge yeah yeah I, I took it in i took it in yeah absolute was the first yeah. vodka that i was kind of like my vodka of oh, choice yeah. before i moved on <laughs> on through my journeys here all right we got a couple of questions here yep. uh mike says what is your recommended process for winterizing a 602 uh generally on anything and it's regardless of whether it's a 602 or anything else uh generally what we'll do is you know number well Number one, make sure it's if if you're in a heated environment or something that's climate controlled to where it's not gonna freeze in there, then normally what we'll do, I mean you can leave the water and everything else in it, you know, over the winter. If not, then obviously you need to drain that out. But secondarily, after we'll take uh oh just a quart of shitty oil. It can be any anything. Hell, it can be transmission fluid, doesn't matter. And light the motor off and start pouring oil down the carburetor. And that'll fog the entire engine. Do that until you got white smoke or blue smoke boiling out the exhaust. Shut it off. And generally it's good. Now, if you're going to drain the water, you should do that after you do the fog. Obviously, that's what I'm saying. Secondarily, I mean, drain the water. but Okay. Gotcha. Um, Anything else? Uh, You know, speaking of winterizing, there are other items that you'd want to winterize as well. So you probably want to put extra... Like spray lube on some of your joints. Well, no, well, carburetor. You, yeah, like when you start talking about stuff that's going to be sitting for quite a while. I mean, my number one thing would be brake fluid. Oh. Uh, so <laughs> make sure before you go racing next season, because brake fluid attracts water. Mm-hmm. So you don't want water in the brakes in the uh, braking system. So obviously, you know, uh, don't necessarily drain it out, but like when it comes time for, you know. The next season, you want to bleed the entire system, get all that old shit out of there, and put new stuff in. Well, something else I picked up at Race Logic is looking at your brake system. That one of the pieces that's really more of a consumable that you want to re- replace every year is your master cylinder. A master. I cylinder would certainly system. do that. Yeah. I mean, it's it's purposely it's a cheap part. I hate to Correct. say that word. No, it's it not is. one that I say a lot, but you know, you've got all these expensive components. And it's the one piece that's really a consumable. Right. So yeah. keep, keep that in mind. And as you're going into winter, just already plan on a, on getting a new master cylinders. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, all three. Mm-hmm. Yes. Good, good thoughts on that. Um, carburetor storage. Let's talk about that because carburetors being a 
significantly higher priced item than they are. Yeah, to be. I mean, drain them out, uh, pop the bowls off, spray everything down with oil, you know, some some sort of lubricant, and call it good. Um, but especially if you're on E85, E85, you need to make sure that everything is drained out of the entire system. Because if E85 dries out, it's extremely gummy. So that's not what you want in the, in the fuel system. Now, what do you use to clean? Like if you're going to pull off the bowls and you're going to clean it, what, what would you recommend? Just any degreaser or something special? Well, I mean, you don't necessarily like need to clean it out. I'm just saying, you know, you can lube it up with something. Okay. So just get the shit out of the carburetor mm -hmm. and then lube it up with whatever. I mean, just really, honestly, really, you can use gun oil. Shit. Use hobbies if you want. So it doesn't really matter. I mean, just, well, it's more of a solvent. But um, yeah, you can use anything. Rod and reel lube. I don't give a shit. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, just spray something in there and you're good to go. Well, like our Daytona one spray lube. And we've got a couple. Just of make sure there's no, you're trying to get rid of the residue from the E85. Yeah. Um, and, and I've also heard the suggestion to store your carburetor in a climate controlled environment. So if there's anything oh, sure. that you would pull out of your, if your shop is not, is not uh, heated, yeah. that you might get one of those carburetor boxes and right. put it on a shelf in your home. So yeah, I would, I would, yeah, I would certainly put it like prominently right on the mantle. So your wife just loves looking at your carburetor box every night. <laughs> <laughs> You would so do that. You would absolutely. Do I don't know. That. Run the carb through the dishwasher. That'll work. Okay. Have, have you? Have I told the dishwasher story on this show before? <laughs> Washing machine might work. Also. Have, have I told Just you? Just don't tumble dry it. Have I told you this story about the dishwasher? <laughs> oh my gosh! When I was growing up, uh, it was again. It was oh, your 80s. dad. Yeah. This would be your dad. Yeah, <laughs> yes, your dad. My dad. He washed something. Now. I can't remember what it was. No, he but something. here was no. Here was the best part: is that one day, Dad. You know, this is during the late well it's probably actually the late 70s and so energy prices were insane back then you know you're a kid you don't care you're like let's why can't we just air condition the outdoors and then it can be comfortable for everybody right. but um at one point he did this whole experiment <coughs> to try to figure out what how much power each of the appliances used you know so it's like okay now you know like plug in the toaster or you know run the microwave well through this whole experimentation process he discovered that the dishwasher took a lot of power so therefore we were no longer, we were going to be doing dishes by hand <laughs> moving forward. So we, uh, we adapted, we went, we went, we went with it, you know, just like we would today. And at some point I remember like, wow, just, something's weird about the dishwasher and then opening it up. And I believe that there, there was a pair of heads inside of the dishwasher. So we couldn't use it. <laughs> I'm going to have to give my dad a... With your dad, that would not surprise me. There's no part of that that surprises <laughs> me. So I'm going to give him a little bit of hell when I, next right. time I see him. So it's kind of <laughs> kind of fun. I, I'd be curious how many other people have used the dishwasher to wash parts. I mean, he had a parts washer, but right. obviously this would be like the... Uh, like your steam tank, I suppose. Oh, yeah, probably. Yeah, so why not, right? All right, we got a couple more questions mm -hmm. here. So Jarrett says, on a 604 crate in the super stock class... Sunoco 102 race fuel is one of the better options. Pump gas or race gas are the options. No methanol, oxygenated fuel, or E85 allowed. E85 is 100% your best option. No, he says no methanol, oh, oh, oh. No, no oxygenated, no E85 or, allowed. Yes, then that 102 is extremely good. That 102 Sunoco, honestly, is like really, really good fuel. Uh, so I would certainly go with that. Um yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd probably go with that. Good I mean, it's, it's right at the right range where it needs to be. Um, there's other fuels. I mean, I think, uh, God, VP makes a 96 octane. Mm -hmm. So that would probably be good as well. I mean, most of those guys will make, you know, fuel in that in that range. But, yeah, I'd, I'd look at, yeah, somewhere. Yeah, yeah, it'll work. Good. It'll be, to me, it'd be better than pump gas. Because pump gas is so inconsistent, and you got water content involved and everything else. So, and I, would, I, I am always going to go with a sealed drum of fuel before pump gas. Agree. Then you just know what you're getting, and you know you just don't want to have a bad night at the. It, it's always a bad night at the race races if you're just dinking around with your carburetor all freaking night. Well, just I mean, to yeah, try to dial just, it in. You know, problem with pump gas is. What do you get? Five percent ethanol content this time, and ten percent, and then fifteen percent, and yeah, 
So it's, it's really gonna hard be to adjust. random. Yeah. All right. Joe has a question. He says, hi, do you see a production end date in the future for the 602 or the 604? Not in the future. I don't know. Uh, it's one of the divisions that actually makes money for GM. So no, I don't. I mean, not unless, you know, a bunch of these assholes have their way and everything's going to be electric and I don't know, by 2024 or something. Yeah, I think that's more in the 2030. No, it's interesting. Uh, actually, when I was going to PRI and I would see Bill Martins up there mm -hmm. from GM and we talked about it, it was always a rumor every, year. every single year where people are talking about, oh, the crate motors are going away. Crate yeah. motors are going away. And then they're not. Um, here's what's interesting. If you read GM's annual report from 2021 mm -hmm. is that how they are paying for all the R&D for all of the EVs, all of the electric mm -hmm. vehicles is through their, especially through their truck sales. Right. Well, what is, what are these engines basically in that same range Essentially, yeah. of, of that? So if they, if, if GM wants to have a strong um, electric future, they'll need, not that the racing piece of it is a big part of it, but, but this is a, there's like a whole network. I mean, you have these performance dealers, right. we have these series that are based around it. This is no, tiny little thing it's a correct it's a it's kind of a big deal oh it's a huge deal yeah so, i mean i know there's other pieces of performance with body body shops i, I would say like unless that. the federal government comes up and says you can no longer produce gas powered engines for yeah. anything then this is going to be around for quite a while agree and oh debbie's here actually from newsome mm -hmm. raceway parts and and she said i hope not yeah, yeah. Well, exactly i mean yeah. it's pretty i mean she won't have a job I won't. Well, right. maybe she would because there are other things that GM sells, right. but I'd have to pivot and figure yeah. something out. The idea is vote out the assholes that are in there now, and we won't have to worry about it. But well, I just think there's enough for everybody. That's a whole other conversation. Well, there's <laughs> enough for everybody to do whatever it is that you want to do. You know, yeah. I mean, I have a an electric motorcycle. <laughs> I mean, I've got no problem with electric shit. I mean, look at Formula One. Look what they're doing in 2024. 2025, whenever it is. Oh, are they doing all electric? Well, well, they're going to a smaller engine and more electric. Mm, okay. You know, whatever. I got yeah. no problem with that. But, you know. Yeah. Let's and, be practical here. <laughs> and Debbie says Newsom needs them to be racing. Exactly. So, yeah. Everybody absolutely. Does. Yeah. I mean, we're this whole network um, that's really important. Yeah. So, uh, one thing that Bill Martin said, I think he's, he's I believe he's retired now, but he, he said, is. yeah, this is. This is not going away anytime soon. The, these engines, the 602s and 604s, are also used in, in hot rods and all kinds of other applications. Well, variations of them, yes. R right, yeah. yeah. But like Chevy 350, um, yeah, they're yeah. not. They're, they're, not. They're, they're a street version of the 602, and there are street versions of the 604, mm -hmm. stuff like that. So. Yeah, so no, there's there is no certainly with the five Certainly with the 525, because that's you know just an LS3 Corvette motor, so. I mean, and, 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 different for circle track, but exactly. But if you're already the, that the, far, the, the you're quarter, not gonna yeah. you're you're not gonna ditch the whole thing. I no, mean, it's so. a whole thing with that whole LS swap Absolutely. thing, and yeah. yeah. So these these aren't going anywhere for yeah. uh, well, I don't I can't say within my whole lifetime or anything, but not for the foreseeable future. I mean, so eventually we'll all have to learn how to fucking do electric motors, but other than that, yeah. other than engines. <laughs> Now, on another topic, Mike says, um, whenever I want cheap gas, I, I eat it. Talk about it. <laughs> <That> works. <laughs> He's on fire tonight. Um, now, Jared's got another question. This is a really good one. I'm really curious about your opinion. He asks, have you tested much with wrapping headers? Is there power to be gained? No, there's not. Um, well, there's not if uh, all you're doing is just simply wrapping the headers. Now there is power that you can help yourself with if it if you're in a scenario to where the carburetor cannot extend out of the hood. So a lot of asphalt type applications, if you're stuck, I mean you can't have the carburetor hanging out the hood mm -hmm. where it's breathing fresh air. So it's got to be under the hood type stuff. With um, with no hole in the hood. Yeah. So if you can reduce any heat getting into that carburetor into the air inlet, then yes, that will help. Um, dirt applications. No, it gains you nothing because normally we've got those air cleaners sealed off to the hood and there's no under under hood temperature getting into the air inlet. inlet. Well, I, I remember talking to uh, uh, um, Greg over at Dynatech mm -hmm. years ago talking yeah. about header wraps. And one thing that... It'll, he, ruin, it'll ruin a non-stainless header in a heartbeat. 
Oh, that's good to know. We didn't talk about that aspect, but we did talk about the fact that any of those header wraps are going to be an insulator. So yes, they're going to separate the heat, but what they really do is they end up trapping the heat inside of the headers. And it trashes the header well, on a mild steel header. Well, and and also if if what you're looking for is cool air anytime, anywhere you can get it, <coughs> when you've got all that superheated air, mm -hmm. that's not going to do you any right. favors for getting get, getting more uh, right. performance. So yeah, in, in, in a certain application, yes, it would be beneficial if you're willing to like go through a bunch of headers. Um, but primarily, no, it's going to gain you nothing if it's a dirt application. Yep. Oh, Matt Henderson is here. He's hey, racing pace. So Matt. hey, Matt, glad glad to have you. Matt has yeah. been a guest on our show before. Yes, certainly. Yeah, Several I times, actually, actually. Yeah, I, I was wearing Matt, uh, Matt my Matt Henderson shirt here recently. I can't remember if it was on the show or not, but. Really? Yeah, I was. I, was I never fucking got one. Well, I bought it. Oh, well, I, I did. I don't want to buy it. Yeah. I just want like a free one. No, but I did. I mean, I like legit went into the and, and bought it is what I did. Legit. I spent my own money and I bought a shirt because I liked the shirt. He made you bleed your own money. Yeah, actually, he wasn't, <laughs> yeah. Made me bleed my own blood. Um, no, it, it was it was one of his uh, one of his. He, he wasn't he wasn't inside the trailer. I'm just fucking around. Yeah, I know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, and Matt says I'll ship one, Steve. So nice. yeah. yeah, yeah, great. Yeah, I, I don't know when we'll see Matt <laughs> next. Yeah, probably. I mean, I know we'll see him in January, but yeah, and that or I will. Yeah, How about you. I'll see him at Race Logic. We're yeah. still working out the details for the crate class. Yeah, I'm still trying to figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. So. One trip at a time. I, I almost feel almost I am this close to feeling like life is getting back to normal for me. I used to travel a bunch and it has been really hard yep. to to just um, just to not have that part of my lifestyle. I mean, I like being I really like being at home, though, so right. it doesn't bother me that so much. But yeah. Anything else? Um, what, any any other topics to talk about? I don't really, honestly. Okay. I mean, I'll just mention the Cars Racing Show. I, I noticed some people have signed up for our email list. We don't even have a welcome series yet, so we will send you an yeah. email at some point for the Cars Racing Show. Uh, but we're signing up more exhibitors. Very excited about that. And, and anybody who's watching, if you happen to have a racing company or a company that has products that are applicable for racers, you know, give me a call. Just contact me, send me a message, whatever, on any of the platforms and would love to, you know, help you get set up with a booth. I really, really love, I mean, this is side note. I really love working with companies who, you know, have, it, this is going to be their very first trade show that they're displaying at. Oh, yeah. And you had several of those last year. I, we certainly so. did. Um, like Steering Buddy, for yeah, instance. Exactly. Uh, they were there. They did really well. They're coming back again. But, you know, they, there were a lot of lessons learned there. And so then this year, like, they're also doing PRI, which is a big deal. Um, this is the smaller show. You know, know, with the cars a racing show. I don't know. I don't know. It's a bubble. Okay. And, well, and then for me to display the cars racing show was my first show to display at. Yeah. You know, but had to figure that out. <laughs> well, you know, it's always I mean, something. Yeah. Yeah. So good, good stuff. But you know, go ahead and sign up for our email list, and we'll be, you know, doing some exhibitor spotlights, and and we'll let everybody know when we release the uh, launch the uh, uh, registration. Mm -hmm. And all of that. So we'll we'll put that out to the world when and email is the really the best <coughs> way. So you can go to carsracingshow.com and sign up for our email list. Yep. Um, or like I said, if you happen to be a potential exhibitor, give me a call and we can talk about it and see if it's a good fit for your company. We'd love to, you know, help move your business forward in that. So yeah, which you can do. Mm -hmm. Because you know, that show's actually a really good show. Well, we get a lot, so many comments talking about the fact that you can take the time since it's not an insanely, like there's not crazy, like carnival circus. Correct. And yeah. it has like the right amount of people. So you can have a meaningful conversation with, be, between the ra a racer and a manufacturer to ask your questions. Kind of like the time we spend here on the podcast. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm just going to compare it to PRI. So my personal experience at PRI I mean, I've stood in the ProFab booth and talked to people. I've stood in our own booth and talked to people at PRI. I've done all this stuff. And what I can tell you is I can have more interaction pe with people at your show mm -hmm. 
than I can at PRI. Yeah, because there's Be just so much to see. Because there's well, there's just so much. You're just getting as a manufacturer, you're just getting bombarded. Oh yeah. And when you're standing there, just getting bombarded. I, I can talk to you for two minutes and then it's that person for two minutes and that person for two minutes. We're at your show. Hell, I can talk to you for 10 minutes, mm -hmm. you know, and then people politely wait mm -hmm. rather than barge in and be like, I got a question, you know, that kind of thing. Got anything new? Uh, yeah, exactly. Got any stickers? Right, exactly. Yeah, okay. Got any stickers? So no, it's, it's a better, better show for me to do your, your deal, especially be, because it's hundred percent circle track. Oriented. It is that, that it is. We don't pretend to be anything else. No. We are a circle track, uh, mostly dirt, but we also are bringing in more asphalt. Correct. I'll tell you what I'd really want. And if anybody has connections, would love to bring in the small cars. I would love to have some mini sprints or micros that, or that outlaws. Old, that, old, that old micro late model. Oh my gosh. Cool. There's so many I late think, models. I, I know. Cool. I, I would love, 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 love to have uh, some of those classes, um, some of those manufacturers at the show. And I think they do really well, yep. and it'd be a, something we definitely would love to promote. For sure. um, there are a couple of other questions okay. here. Yeah. So let's, let's see. Grab uh, those and yep. Call and then we'll roll, it, roll from there. Yep. So Jared says, what is your recommendation for a distributor on a 604 super stock on a 12 volt system? I mean. My camera is blinking at me. I'm making sure, make sure that it's plugged in. Okay. okay. Like a couple of years ago, I'd say fast all day long, but. That's not so much now just because of, I think they've got issues with their boxes and producing boxes and all that stuff. So it's just going to be MSD built distributor. And then like, you know, firing it with an MSD box, honestly. Great. Um, I mean, and that'll, that'll work just fine. And then at that point, if you're on an MSD, you can literally go to like a 16 volt battery and you won't have a problem. If you wanted to. Great. And okay, then we're going to have some more E85 questions because Jerry says, what is C85? All right. C85 is actually a more oxygenated version of the X85 that uh, BP makes. And in most series, it's actually not a legal fuel. So the specific gravity is actually too high. Mm -hmm. And as a follow up here, is it like regular X85 or is it better? Uh, it's better. It could potentially, it, it will produce more power, yes. But again, it's going to be illegal in most series where they have a specific gravity rule. Mm -hmm. Great. Oh, and uh, Andrew is here from Profab, Profab Headers. Of course, we've been talking about Headers yeah. a little bit tonight. And he says, we will have a kid's outlaw cart in our booth. Oh, that'd be awesome. Yeah. Yeah, like your show. Yeah. 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 So I'm really excited about that. That'd be cool. Um, oh, and one more follow up here. So can it be run with the same cat carburetor? Looks like the X85 and the C85. Can you it, run them it, in the same it, carburetor? It can, yes. But you, you'll need to like actually ratio it up a little bit. Okay, we're we're having because, like, because again more oxygen content. So the more oxygen, the richer the mixture needs to be. We got like rapid fire now. Right. So <laughs> Jared says, uh, "What RPM range should I gear for on quarter and three eighths tracks? Are you still making any power turning sixty eight hundred, or would you be better off not running that many RPM? We must run a sixty eight hundred chip." All right, so I assume we're talking about six oh four, and so uh, let's see. I would I would gear it to hit the chip right at the end of the straightaway, honestly, because I mean that's what we've always done and that's what works. Now you don't want to be banging the chip at the flag stand unless you're on like some little short shithole, dry ass slick track where you need to like get off the corner. You got traction, but you need to get off the corner. Then that's the only time I've seen that beneficial is like hitting the chip of the flag stand. I just was enjoying that whole description of your of a racetrack there. The, what? Yeah, the. Uh, shitty uh <laughs> i'm gonna have to play it back because it was funny okay i'm sorry yeah no it's good. i didn't try to be funny i just like <laughs> speaking in terms and that people can understand, can understand I mean, just my, my the way i speak but yep. no no i mean yeah 6800 um i'd be on the chip just at the corner so good to know um some quarter mile tracks it depends on the shape of the track too is it a momentum or same with three eighths I mean, you can have a momentum type track where, I mean, you can basically flat foot it all the way around the thing. Or if it's a stop and go place, most stop and go like quarters and three eighths tracks. If it's stop and go, then yeah, it could be beneficial to be hitting the flip, hitting the rev limiter, you know, a little bit past flag stand. Okay. Just to get off the corner. Cause I mean, where are you passing people off the corner? Not right. At the end of the straightaway normally. 
on places like that. Good point. And all those uh, fuel questions, he says, perfect. Thank you. So that cleared things up for him. So that is all I have. Any any yep. other final thoughts, Steve? No, I got to go make a sandwich. Sandwich. You can make your own sandwich. Good deal. Or I'm going to go buy a sandwich is what I'm going to do. <laughs> that actually is. To be honest. <laughs> Go up, have somebody else gonna go up to make main street market and buy a sandwich <laughs> all right for a little plug for main street market in rutherford north carolina well i want to thank you all for being here thank you so much for being part of the show and we love all of your questions and we will look forward to seeing you next monday 7 p.m eastern have a great week see ya